All right, so first I, I would like to uh, thank Marco and Fabrizio for inviting me, but even more important for organizing this uh, lecture series, which I find um, simply extraordinary. I think that's a, a great development in, in, in philosophy in general and the philosophy of neuroscience, and I hope it's going to be very successful and that uh, it, it, it will have a long life in, in, in the future. It's wonderful to be able to bring together uh, people from all over the world to discuss philosophy of neuroscience. So thanks, uh, Marco and Fabrizio, for this amazing initiative. So I hope you can hear me all very well, and I will assume that it is the case from uh, now on. So what I want to be talking about today is uh, a long-standing issue in uh, philosophy, an issue that has distinguished a philosopher like David Hume from a philosopher like René Descartes. And in a nutshell, to simplify the question, Hume argued that uh, concepts and percepts, or conceptual representations and perceptual representations, are of the same kind. While Descartes argued, as you all know, that concepts and percepts are of a different kind. And that issue has been widely debated in philosophy and in psychology in the 19th century. Indeed, much of introspective psychology in the 19th century with people like Wundt and Titchener was concerned with that question, using introspection as a means to answer this question. Uh, this question is not dead, and indeed, it has been ex ex extensively debated in, uh, philosoph in philosophy of psychology, philosophy of neuroscience, and in the cognitive sciences over the last uh, 20 years. I think it's fair to say that uh, the empiricist position, roughly Hume's position, may well be now the dominant view in, uh, 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 in the sciences. Uh, sometimes it goes under the name of embodied cognition. In psychology, leading, leading psychologists such as Barsalou, Glenberg, and Mendler endorse one version or other of empiricism. In uh, neuroimaging and neuropsychology, people like Damasio, Martin, and Thompson Shield also have empiricist views. That's also the case in AI, linguistics, and, and, and philosophy. What I want to do today is to try to provide a counterweight to what I take to be the dominant view about the nature of concepts in contemporary cognitive science and neuroscience. Uh, what I will be doing is, for the sake of time and precision, I will be focusing mostly uh, on the views articulated by, on the one hand by uh, Larry Barsalou, uh, and on the other hand by uh, J.C. Uh, Prince. There are differences between empiricists about concepts uh, that don't all agree about the same views and the views have changed over time. But for the sake of simplicity, my, my foils today will be uh, Barsalou and, and, and Prince. Um, now, <coughs> Barsalou, in a very influential review, which is now slightly ancient, has made a number of claim about, claims about the virtues of empiricist views of concepts and about the limitations of a model views of concepts. Uh, among the things he's been arguing for are uh, the following one. He's been arguing that uh, there are very few views for the type for a model series of concepts or Cartesian series of concepts. He thinks uh, that these theories have been endorsed mostly for theoretical reasons and not for empirical reasons. By contrast, he thinks that there are actually a lot of evidence of various types that support an empiricist or embodied approach to, to, to concepts. And what I want to do in this lecture is to challenge both, both views. And indeed, I will be arguing uh, that the conceptual brain is, by and large, an amodal system. So I will be arguing that Descartes got it right and Hume got it wrong. Uh, here's the structure of the lecture. What I will do in section one is uh, say uh, a few more things about the contrast between empiricist views of concepts on the one hand and uh, uh, amodal views of concepts on the other hand. Then I will be focusing on Barsalou's first claim very quickly, namely the claim that there is a lot of evidence for empiricist or embodied views of concepts, and I will be arguing that uh, Barsalou here is overstating uh, the case. In fact,
fact, I think there are uh, uh, quite strong limitations to the type of, of, of evidence that uh, uh, Basalu and other empiricists have been putting forward. Uh, uh, and the, in the third section, which is the, the main section of this talk, I will look at what I take to be an increasingly large and compelling body of evidence for the claim that the brain is really an emodal system and that conceptual representations are actually emodal representations. And I'll be spending a bit of time looking at some specific uh, uh, types of research. There's much more. Uh, findings that I can uh, talk about today, but I hope that it will be give you a sense of the type of evidence that suggests that concepts are actually a model. And then in the last section, I will be looking at the following puzzle. If it's true that concepts are a model, why is there some good evidence that when we try to solve some conceptual tasks, tasks which are meant to involve conceptual representations, we do seem on often, or at least sometimes, uh, to use uh, uh, perceptual representations. And that's a puzzle I'm going to try to address uh, in a fairly speculative and, and abstract manner in the last section of this talk. So let's start with a contrast between empiricist views of concepts and amodal views of concepts. And a good starting point is the following quotation by uh, Jesse Prince in uh, Mind and, and, and Language. Jesse, in this paper, writes that to think about a category, empiricist will say, is to simulate an encounter with that category in a sensory way. Because categories look different in different circumstances, simulating an encounter requires drawing on a wealth of knowledge. The sources of information are all very different, but they share several things in common on an empiricist picture. They are all made up of sensory representation, they are all acquired through experience, and they are all drawn on to create temporary simulations in working memory. Um, we can ex extract from this uh, quotation the following two claims about the commitments of empiricists about, about concepts. The first commitment is about the nature of the representations used in thought. It's commitment one here on the screen. The second commitment is about the nature of cognitive processing, the nature of, of, of thinking. And uh, what I want to do in the next few slides is to go to say a few more things about both commitments. So let's start with uh, the first uh, commitment. So information that is stored in a concept is encoded in perceptual representational codes or formats. Now, one, two things to be said about this claim is to, to notice, two, two things to notice about this claim is that according to this characterization of empiricism, empiricism is not about the acquisition of concepts. It's not about innateness. And empiricism is not, is not a claim about semantics. It's not a claim about uh, the idea that we can reduce the content of concepts to sensory concepts, right? We can uh, uh, sort of a uh, uh, reductive uh, claim about the content of concepts. Rather, um, according to this characterization of empiricism, the maintenance of empiricist series of concepts is a claim about format, a claim about codes. Uh, so let's see a little bit how this works. So here is a very simplified, it's a toy characterization of what is going on in, in perception that is by and large shared by empiricists and emodal theorists about concepts. Uh, when we perceive something, there is an event in the world, for example, a dog barking, and uh, there are a, phenomen a phenomenon of transduction in our sensory organs, for example, in the eyes, uh, in the eyes and in the ear. So uh, transduction in the sensory organs results in vision-specific representations and in audition-specific uh, representations. These representations themselves may be in many formats. There is no commitment to having one format for, for vision and one format to, uh, for auditions. There may be actually many formats of codes for, vi for vision, many formats of code for for representation. That picture is, is shared by empiricists and uh, emodal theorists. Where emodal theorists and empiricists diverge is what happens next, what happens when a concept is, is formed. According to emodal theorists, what is going on in the formation of an emodal concept of dog is a phenomenon of translation. The information that's encoded in perceptual formats 
get to be translated into a new format, a format or code that is characteristic of thought. Uh, so the relation between perceptual representations and conceptual representation is one of translation. Right? Uh, think, and here, I mean, translation in a very commonsensical way, it's the same thing that's going on when we translate French to English or one computer code to another, to another uh, computer code. By contrast, uh, empiricist theories are going to argue that the relation between uh, perceptual representations and amodal representations is not one of translation, it's one of selection. Right? So what is happening in, uh, when a, a concept is created or stored in long-term memory is a selection of some of the perceptual representations to be stored in long-term memory. And as a result, the format of or the code of conceptual representation is the same as the format or the code of perceptual representation. Right. So that's the first tenet. It's a claim about the nature of conceptual representation. Uh, Immodal theorists are thinking in terms of a distinct code of format and the relation between perceptual and conceptual representations is one of translation. By contrast, empiricist theorists are, think, are arguing that the format of conceptual representation and perceptual representation is the same. And, and as a result, the relation between uh, concepts and percepts is one of selection of a subset of perceptual representations. So that's the first claim. It's, it's a claim about the nature of the representation. The second claim is a claim about thinking, about the nature of cognitive processing. And the idea here is that um, when one is thinking, what one is doing is reenacting a perceptual uh, 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 experience, or a perceptual representation. Uh, so when one is categorizing, one is drawing on one's perceptual information about what a dog looks like, for example, what a dog sounds like, what a dog smells like, and reenacting perceiving a dog. And this reenactment is used to make, for example, a categorization judgment. The same would be true for inferring, for drawing inductive inferences about a dog, for imagining a dog, and so on and so forth. We reenact having a perceptual encounter with a, a dog using the perceptual information that has been stored in long-term memory. Uh, it's uh, worth noting uh, for the uh, sake of completeness that the reenactment need not be conscious, right? Neither Barcelou, nor Prince, nor any other empiricist theorist of concept believe that whenever we uh, are thinking, we have a conscious experience. But we are reenacting, nonetheless reenacting, having a perceptual representation of, of, of the dog. Now, at this point, it is uh, worth mentioning two important philosophical questions that are central to the debate as I've been framing it so far. The first philosophical question is about the notion of a code or the notion of a format. And there are two subsidiary questions. The first subsidiary question is what's a format? The second subsidiary question is how are formats individuated? And I think um, uh, here it's worth saying that it's a very muddled and unsettled question. In fact, it's a question that has by and large attracted very little attention. There are, to my knowledge, almost um, there are no classic paper on, on the question. And um, uh, it's actually a surprising fact that this notion hasn't been more theorized in the philosophy of psychology. Uh, I've seen in recent uh, months, actually, a few uh, papers under review that are actually trying to theorize about this question. I'm delighted that there is more philosophical attention about the notion of format and about the individuation of, of format. Nonetheless, what we can do is start with some clear cases. So we, we might say that the binary notation versus a, a decimal notation of integers is actually, uh, involves actually two distinct formats, two distinct codes for representing numbers. We may also say that English versus French are two distinct codes. We uh, may say that if we look to computer languages, that BASIC versus Fortran are also two distinct codes. So we have these very clear cases that we can use to anchor uh, the uh, notion of a code and the individuation of codes or format. But I think that as soon as we move uh, beyond these very clear cases, 
what we have what we should be saying about format individuation becomes really quite muddled so for example is written english or spoken english um uh, distinct code well i don't really know and i'm not exactly sure what i should be saying in addition to having clear cases and ambiguous cases, we have also some uh, clear principles about what codes are and how to individuate them. One of them is that the properties that define indiv in individuated formats are not semantic, right? So uh, when one is theorizing about what's a format and individuating formats, the relevant properties are not semantic. On the other hand, uh, not every non-semantic property uh, is a definitive and individuative of a format. Consider, for example, uh, these two ways of writing the word cat, for example, Helvetica versus Nistral. Uh, one may think here that one does not have two different formats, but one way uh, of individuating, uh, we have the same format, despite the fact that uh, there are non-semantic differences between these two token, token words. But I think that um, uh, when one goes beyond the other clear cases and these very clear um, uh, principles about format individuation, we don't have a very clear grasp about the notion of format. And that, that might well worry some of you about whether or not the debate between empiricists and immodal uh, series of concepts is well posed, right? It seems to rely on a notion that's uh, uh, modeled and not well clarified. Um, so, and that's actually a real worry that uh, also concerns uh, me. The good news in this area, I believe that we can do with a, a, a notion of format that's not fully clarified, that's not entirely clear. And to do so, we can take a cue from other bits of science that seems to be, to be doing just fine with notions that are not very clear and whose principle of individuations are actually fairly uh, uh, muddled. Consider linguistics, for example. Uh, two notions are central to, uh, to linguistics, the notion of a language, the notion of a dialect. But just like the notion of a format, what's a language and how to individuate languages is extremely unclear in linguistics. And that does not prevent linguistics from making clear progresses. Clear progress. The same is true of psychology and uh, cognitive neuroscience. The notion of representation is uh, central to uh, cognitive psychology and cognitive neuroscience. But of course, but, uh, that notion is as unclear as the notion of a format, and the individuation conditions of representation are as unclear as the individuation conditions of um, uh, the notion of a format. So, uh, of, of, of formats. So I, I do believe that uh, uh, despite the fact that the key notion of format is actually unclear and the individuation condition of formats are unspecified, we can still make progress. So second, the second theoretical question that we need to say a few words about in this area is the following one. What distinguishes a non-perceptual code from perceptual codes of formats? You may be worried here that, uh, uh, that to the extent that we don't have an answer to this question, the debate between a model theories of concept and empiricist theories of concept is going to be a model. So bad news, of course, here is that we don't have an answer to this question. Nobody uh, has, at least to my view, a satisfactory answer to uh, this uh, question. Now, there are proposals about what distinguishes uh, perceptual from non-perceptual formats. For example, Barthelou has been arguing that perceptual or modal formats are analog or analogical, while um, uh, non-perceptual or amodal formats are linguistic or propositional. Now, uh, as all of you know, an analog uh, format, an analog representation would be one where properties of the vehicle of the representation co-vary with properties of what is represented. Thermometers, for example, or maps are great examples of analog representation so understood. By contrast, linguistic representation would not have this property. Now, there are various problems with this way of characterizing the contrast between perceptual and non-perceptual representations. For example, Prince, in his first book on concept, has noted that, um, according to Wittgenstein, sentences are actually 
stand in an analog representation with the fundamental structure of the world. Uh, and if that is the right way of thinking about sentences, then the contrast between analog and linguistic gets to be is lost. Uh, another issue, one which I have uh, uh, put forward, is that uh, in analog computer, analog computers use analog representations, but there is no sense in which uh, in which the representations that they use are actually perceptual. So I think the contrast between analog and linguistic is not the right way to draw the con to uh, explicate the contrast between perceptual and modal formats. Jesse Prince, as an alternative, he argues that uh, perceptual representations or are just or perceptual formats are just the formats used by perceptual systems. But that answer won't be extremely helpful until we have a characterization of what a perceptual system is. Uh, and again, here there is no uh, agreement about how to spell out that notion. So again, you may be very worried that the debate re relies on a contrast that's unspecified, that the main answers, the main ways to, to explicate the contrast are actually unsatisfactory. The good news again here is that I think we can bracket this question. What we need, as often is the case in science, is not a stipulative characterization of the distinction between a modal and modal format. But rather, what we need are plausible tests, plausible, defeasible tests for whether the representations involved in a given task are perceptual or not, right? And I think we do have such tests. And I think that's a common situation in science where we don't have a clear understanding of the nature of a thing or of the, of the deep contrast between two different things, but we have a defeasible test about whether that thing is happening or whether one of two things is happening. Now, what are those tests? Well, there are behavioral tests and uh, neuroscientific tests. And here are just a few examples of these uh, tests. Uh, so let me just give, say a few words about um, them, uh, looking at the behavioral test first. Um, if a representation involved in a given task is perceptual, then we should be expecting transfer cost when we are going to be thinking about different perceptual modalities. So what's the idea here? So let's suppose that when I have to categorize something, I use perceptual representation. And let's suppose that I'm asked to uh, categorize, uh, 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 to make judgments about the colors uh, of a given set of objects. Then I'm asked to make judgments about the sounds of this very same set of objects. If uh, uh, the representations of uh, these objects are perceptual, then it should be easier to uh, make judgment within the same modality, to make judgments about colors, than to switch to um, uh, the sounds uh, that these objects make. There should be a transfer cost when I'm moving from colors to sounds. And transfer cost can be uh, measured experimentally by looking at errors, mistakes, the number of mistakes, and at reaction times. And that type of uh, uh, um, uh, test has been extensively used by empiricist series of concepts. Another form or another test is facilitation and interference of perception on cognition. The idea here is that if, to, if it is true that to think about a category, for example, to think about a set of objects, is to uh, reenact perceiving these objects, then my perceptual experiences or my motor experiences should interfere in various ways with my thinking. Uh, a nice example comes from the following type of research. Uh, some people argue that our moral concepts involve, uh, uh, um, 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 motor, involve motor representations. For example, the concept of good may involve the motor representation of grabbing something and putting, in, putting it closer to oneself. The concept of bad involves pushing something away, right? Uh, it was a motor representation of pushing something away. If that's true, then one predicts an interference between uh, uh, a behavior and one thinking. It should, be, it should be harder to judge that something is bad when one is asked but by, to answer by, push, by pulling a lever to one, toward oneself that, than by pushing a lever away from oneself, right? So the, uh, the empiricist view of concept predicts some specific interferences 
between perception or action and thinking. All right? So that's the type of behavioral tests I have in mind. The type of neuroscientific tests look at the localization of brain activation. If thinking involves clearly perceptual brain areas, uh, brain areas that are by in any view perceptual, then that's evidence for uh, the uh, modal approaches to concept, to the for the empiricist approaches to concept. If thinking involves a single area rather than a distributed area of uh, a distributed number of perceptual areas, then that's evidence for the amodal Cartesian series of concepts. So the view here is that we can use this test, all of which are defeasible, to provide defeasible evidence for the claim either that concepts are perceptual or that concepts are amodal. We can do without a specification of the nature of perceptual or amodal representation by using these defeasible tests. And I think that's a very common situation in the history of, of science. We don't need to have an understanding of temperature to be able to measure temperature, right? uh, and so on and so forth. All right, now that we have specified the debate a little bit more, we can look first at the limitations of the evidence for neuroempiricism and then at the evidence for the amodal brain. And I'll try to be quick for the second section of this lecture. So empiricists are provided by types of evidence for uh, their views, they provided behavioral evidence and neuroimaging evidence, and I will say very quickly a few things about both. I've already written extensively about behavioral evidence now a few years ago. Uh, in 2007, I published the following paper in uh, Cognition, Concept Empiricism, uh, a Methodological Criticism, and here I made uh, uh, the following claims. I argue first that there was an issue in the way the dialectic was uh, set up by empiricist psychologists. What they were trying to, what they were usually doing is focus on one amodal model of concepts and argue that this amodal model of concept made the wrong prediction with respect to various psychological phenomena in contrast to empiricist models of concept which make the right prediction. So the problem with that way of setting up the dialectic is that there are other amodal models of concept that make exactly the same prediction as the so, uh, empiricist models of concepts that empiricist psychologists were using. And as a result, much of the empiricist psychological research were falsifying some specific amodal models of concepts, but not all amodal models of, 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 of concepts. Right? And I call that problem Anderson's problem. And I gave a few examples of that situation in this 2007 paper. The second problem is what I call the imagery problem. And to see the problem, we just need to remind ourselves that a model series of concepts, such as, for example, Jerry Fodor, do not deny that to solve some task, we use imagery, right? Uh, there's a wide consensus. Most people agree that most people in most situations use imagery to solve various tasks, including various cognitive tasks. Uh, as a result, just showing that uh, Perceptual representations are used to solve a task fails to be evidence for an empiricist approach to concept. Uh, what one wants to show is that the situation in which perceptual representations are used is not one where a model theories would be expecting people to use imaging to solve our imagery to solve that task. And that challenge has rarely been met uh, uh, by uh, uh, psycholo empiricist psychologist of, of, of concept. Now, turning to uh, neuroimaging, here's another quote from uh, uh, my foil here today, Basalu et al. Uh, Tick's review. Um, and I think that claim is still widely shared by uh, uh, empiricist cognitive neuroscientists. Uh, the view here is that when one looks at the activi activation of concepts, what one finds is often an overlap between the perceptual representations and the conceptual representation. Uh, in a nutshell, when, when, when you think about red, for example, you're going to involve a part of your brain that is before that's extremely close to the part of or that overlaps with the part of your brain that's involved in perceiving the color red. And the conclusion here is supposed to be that uh, conceiving involves the same representation as, as, perce as uh, perceiving. Uh, now here's the empirical situation is a little bit muddled. 
uh, on the one hand, for a very long time, most of the studies really showed that the conceptual representations were near and at best, but rarely overlapped with the perceptual representations. Uh, but in fact, in most of the study, it's actually not the case that conceptual representations and perceptual representations involve the same part of the brain. Uh, in most studies, in fact, they are disjoint, entirely uh, disjoint, and they can be as far as one centimeter from one another, which of course in the brain matters quite a bit. Now, as I said, the situation is a bit more muddled because some recent work, for example, by Thompson Shield, seems to provide some more compelling evidence of overlaps or even identity. Uh, so, so here, uh, the situation may be a little bit more muddled than it was a few years ago. So, in any case, I think the problems have been highlighted. The problems both for the behavioral evidence and for the neuroimaging evidence show that uh, Barcelos' claim that there is actually a large amount of evidence for an embodied or PVC approach to concept is, at the very least, another statement. Uh, what I want to do uh, next, and that's the bulk of, of this course, of this talk, is going to take the next uh, 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 10 minutes, um, is uh, look at the evidence for uh, the amodal brain. And I will be looking at behavioral evidence, neuroimaging evidence, and neuropsychological evidence in, in, in turn. So let's start with behavioral evidence. And I will be focusing first on the number sense, because it's the best uh, case, I believe, for the amodal approach to concepts. So here is one characteristic of uh, the number sense. So the number sense is our capacity to assess the rough number of objects in a, in, a, in a visual scene or the rough number of events or sounds in a sequence of sounds, uh, for example. Uh, the same is true of, 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 uh, touch, of touch and so on and so forth. So here's one property of the number sense. The property is Weber slope. As the number of objects to be estimated increase, that's what you see on the uh, right part of your screen, the standard deviation of people's answer also increase. And as a result, the ratio between the mean number of objects to be evaluated to the standard deviation is a constant. Now, one striking fact about the number sense is that Weber's law is true of the estimation of the number of objects in a visual sense and in a sequence of sounds, right? We find the same law that governs these two, uh, 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 these two uh, um, estimation of the number of, of items. What's the best explanation for that? The best explanation is that the cognitive system and the representations it is defined over that is used to, by the number sense is actually an amodal. There's a single amodal system used to assess the number of objects when one is seeing and when one is hearing. Right? That's the first type of argument. It's an argument from uh, the best explanation. The second type of, uh, uh, of argument for the amodal nature of the representation of numbers is the fact that um, there is no transfer cost. Right? Remember, transfer cost is meant to be evidence for uh, a empiricist series of concepts. In the case of numbers, there is no transfer cost. If I ask you to add the number of objects in, in a visual scene to the, num to the number of objects in another visual scene, and if I compare that to asking you to add the number of objects in a visual scene to the number of sounds in a sequence of sounds, you're going to be equally accurate and you're not going to be slower, right? So, just, so the fact there is no transfer cost, again, suggests there is a, there is a single amodal uh, a cognitive system that uses amodal representations to uh, assess the number of objects, to estimate the number of objects. Now, let's move to uh, neuroimaging. We have excellent neuroimaging of the number sense. The number sense involve, involves a distributed system of areas throughout the brain involving some areas in the prefrontal cortex. One of the crucial areas in the number sense is uh, what you see now on the screen is the intraparietal circus uh, as, uh, from a bilateral point of view. And, it's very clear now that the IPS is involved in uh, estimating the number of objects. So what the following paper by uh, Piazza and colleague did about 10 years ago is to look at the activation of the network of areas involving in estimating the number of objects when the uh, objects are presented visually 
and when the objects are presented auditorily. Uh, and uh, the outcome here is that activation was, as you can see here uh, at the end of the quotation, independent from stimulus modality, right? Activation is invariant over the modality, over the, uh, the modality of the stimuli. And you can see that, for example, if you look on the left part of the, sc of, 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 uh, uh, the screen in uh, the panel, estimation compared to a matching. And if you look at three, three here looks at the activation for the intraparietal sulcus. And uh, what you have, the first three bars are for the visual stimuli, the last three bars are for the auditory stimuli. And as you can see is that there is just no difference between uh, activation uh, depending on which, on the modality of, of the stimuli. Again, that provides you with evidence, the feasible evidence, that uh, the representations involved in estimating the number of objects are actually a model, not model. All right, so far I've been focusing on concepts of numbers, but you may think, okay, maybe the concepts of numbers are one exception. What about other concepts? So let's move on. Let's look at concepts of action. Um, and here is a beautiful paper by uh, Marina uh, Bedney, published in uh, 2008 uh, eight with uh, Karamaza and uh, Rebecca Sachs and Pascal Leone and uh, Emily Grossman. So what they did in this paper is ask people to make uh, 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 judgments about the semantic similarity between verbs and nouns. And they look at two types of verbs, verbs which are highly associated with motion, verbs which are, uh, which are not associated with motion, nouns which are highly associated with motion, and nouns which are not associated with motions. That's what you can see here on the left part of your screen. And then they look at brain activation when people were doing the semantic similarity task. To do the semantic similarity task, you need to retrieve the concept. If retrieving the concept is uh, reenacting an experience of the object of the concept, then you should be expecting variation in uh, uh, the areas involved in the perception of motion for the verbs and nouns which are highly associated with motion compared to the verbs and nouns which are not associated with motions. All right, that's an empiricist prediction. Now, what are those areas? Uh, at least two areas of the brain are associated with the perception of motion. Empty, empty which is associated with just with the perception of any motion. And uh, the left and right STS, superior temporal sulcus, which is associated with the perception of biological motion. What you can see here on the right part of the screen, if you look at MT and the STS, is that MT failed to distinguish any of these types of verbs and nouns. It was a, a general negative result. By contrast, STS did distinguish between verbs and nouns. That's what you see in uh, the uh, um, uh, third and fourth sets of bars. However, it fails to distinguish between verbs highly associated with motion and verbs which are not associated with motion and between nouns which are associated with motion and nouns which are not associated with motion. Right? So contrary to the empiricist prediction, there was no differential activation depending on whether the concepts were associated with motion or not. Right? So this negative result suggests that the, the concept expressed by verbs and nouns do not involve reenacting a perceptual experience of uh, motions. Uh, again, this negative result here provide evidence for a modal views of concepts of, of, of action. Now we can move to another type of, of research, again done by uh, Marina uh, Bedney uh, uh, in her more, more recent work. So uh, Bedney and again with Karamada, Pascal, Leone and Sachs, uh, this researcher has a beautiful idea to use uh, people who have been blind since birth, congenitally, congenit con people blind, blind since birth. The thought here is that if you've been blind since birth, you never had perceptual representations of the um, extension of, of concepts. And as a result, when you're reenacting, uh, your, uh, uh, when you are thinking about uh, the extension of concept, when you are using your concept, your activation should be different from the activation of sighted people if empiricist theories of concepts are, are true. Now, is that the case? 
uh, well, la, what uh, they did, what Bedney and colleagues did in this paper is look at uh, people thinking again about action, comparing uh, sighted participants with non-sighted participants, with congenita congenitally blind participants. And what you see uh, now on the right part of your screen is that activation was nearly identical for uh, sighted and uh, blind uh, people, suggesting again that uh, our, our concepts of action here are a modal uh, concept. Now we've looked at concepts of number, concepts of actions. What about concepts of mental states? Again, mentalizing involves a network of areas in the brain, involving the prefrontal cortex as well as other areas. But one area that, is, uh, that has been extremely well examined uh, by neuroimagers is a right temporal parietal junction that you see now on the screen. It's an important uh, node for uh, thinking about uh, mental states. And again, we can use the same methodology. We can compare sighted people with people who have been blind since birth. And that's what Bedney and colleagues have done in this PNAS paper in 2009. And again, what you see here on uh, the uh, quote is that uh, they failed to find any difference between blind people and sighted people, suggesting that the representations that are involved in uh, mentalizing are a model. And here are the data that's uh, activation in the uh, uh, temporal parietal uh, junction that you can see here uh, on the images. And as you can see, there are pretty much, there are very little difference, uh, at least for the RTPG, for both groups of, of participants. All right, moving away from neuroimaging, what about neuropsychology? I'll give you two types of evidence. The first one comes from uh, the work of Brad Mahon and, and colleagues. So Brad Mahon has been a lot of work in the area. I'm going to be citing here an early paper, but he's done some uh, different uh, work since uh, then. The idea here is to find dissociations between our capacity to e either perceive or use things, so to act or perceive, and our capacity to think. And these dissociations are meant to show that uh, uh, our concepts are distinct from our, our percepts. So in that early uh, paper, Negri and colleagues provide evidence for a double dissociation between our capacity to uh, use concepts, uh, to use tools, and our capacity to recognize tools. So what you see here uh, are three uh, patients which are able to use tools, so their motor representations are intact, but they are unable to uh, recognize tools. By contrast, these three patients here are the opposite dissociation, so we have double dissociation. They are able to recognize tools, so their conceptual representations are intact, but they are unable to use tools, so their motor representations are impaired. Suggesting that a concept of tools can't be identified with motor representations. Because if they were, we would not be expecting these double dissociations. Um, um, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, Mao and colleagues have done further work looking at uh, additional patients. Uh, so that's a beautiful uh, type of, of research. The last body of evidence I want to mention is a work on semantic dementia. Semantic dementia is, uh, that's a work I've done with my former graduate student, Joe McAfray. We published that in 2012. It's part of a, a longer paper. A semantic dementia is a disorder that involves um, um, uh, the uh, anterior poles of the, um, uh, the anterior poles, and it's characterized by a loss of concepts, among, among other things. Uh, we thought and we still think that empiricist and amodal theories would be making two distinct predictions about uh, the loss of concepts involved in semantic dementia. Empiricists would be predicting a modality-specific conceptual loss, right? You would be losing your capacity to think about what uh, objects look like, and then your capacity to think about what objects sound like, and what your capacity is to think about what objects smell like, and so on and so forth. By contrast, a model theories would be predicting a modality general conceptual loss. Uh, which of these two predictions is the right one? Well, research on uh, semantic dementia clearly shows uh, that the conceptual loss is modality general. We don't lose our capacity to, to, to uh, think about what uh, dogs 
uh, and cats and uh, books look like, but rather we lost our capacity to think about animals and then our capacity to think about um, uh, artifacts, for example. Right? Uh, so that uh, falsifies or that provides evidence, I should say, against the empiricist views of, of concepts. All right, so that was a very quick review of the type of evidence which, in my mind, provides, provides support for an emodal approach to concepts. In two minutes, and then I'll stop there, I want to address uh, the puzzle, the following puzzle. We do have clear evidence that at least some tasks which involve concept rely on perceptual representations. Uh, some of this evidence comes from the beautiful work done by Rob Goldstone, which shows that very simple visual cues are central to do arithmetic operations, right? So our group, our, the grouping of numbers into um, um, uh, 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 arithmetic operations, addition, subtraction, multiplication, depends on, on, on visual cues. That's a very compelling body of, of work, suggesting that to do arithmetic, we do use our perceptual representations. Now, how can we square the idea that concepts are emodal with the evidence that perceptual representations happen to be used? Well, the offloading hypotheses provide a sketch of a response. I'm not claiming it's a detailed response. It raises as many questions as it answers, probably more questions than it answers. Uh, but it's at least a sketch of a response. And the idea here is that we often offload uh, the solution of cognitive tasks on perceptual and motor systems. The concepts themselves are emodal, but sometimes we don't use our concepts, or we don't use our concepts only to solve tasks. We also appeal to perceptual and motor representations to solve tasks, probably because it's more efficient to do so. It gives us uh, more efficient solutions than just to use our concepts or to use our concepts at all. So that's, that's the, uh, the gist of the offloading hypothesis. Now, to conclude this talk, since I'm running a little bit late, I think the empirical evidence does suggest that the brain is, by and large, an emodal system that sometimes, in some circumstances, to be specified, offload its task onto perceptual and, and motor system. If that's true, by and large, uh, Descartes uh, got it right and uh, Hume got it wrong. So if you're interested, here are a few papers, my original 2007 critique of uh, concept empiricism, focusing on the behavioral evidence, the work with Joe McAfray on uh, semantic dementia, and a more recent work where I review some of the evidence for the model brain and sketch uh, the offloading hypothesis, right? Thank you for your uh, uh, attention.